Okay. Definition. There's going to be a lot of definitions today. Um, and there's going to be a lot of words, so don't get too bogged down by it. Let F and G be defined on a region. R is a subset of R2. And a vector field in R2 is a function. Uh, and we call it F. Notice that I'm using the vector notation because vector field, we, with the word vector, I should already get a clue, um, that assigns assigns to each point in R a vector f of x, y, and then g of x, y. Notation is important. These are scalar value functions. So a scalar value function is going to spit out a scalar. And so a scalar is the component of a vector. Scalar is a component of a vector. Two scalar value functions are the components of a vector, the field. Okay. All right, there's different ways we can write the field. So it's just some notational things. I could just say, just think about all the way back to chapter 13. It's pretty straightforward. This vector is just whatever f and g are. And since these are scalar valued functions, if you really wanted to put it into component form, I don't often do it because I think it's dumb, but a lot of engineering textbooks do this. And so I'll show it to you so you're not surprised by it. fxyi plus gxyj. But it's the same idea, right? So it's the x coordinate, the y coordinate, and then these are just scalars. Again, here's the thing: don't let notation. Uh, don't marry yourself to notation. Marry yourself to the idea. If these are just scalars, this is just going to be some sort of a scalar that's multiplied by the x coordinate, uh, x component, some sort of scalar multiplied by the g component. But the key thing here is fields are they can there's a lot there's a lot more freedom because these as functions. The scalar that gets spit out can depend on where I choose to drop my point in the region. Okay. Um, let's see. So then a field is going to be continuous or differentiable on your region, so long as these functions are continuous or differentiable. That should make sense, right? So if F and G are differentiable, then the overall vector field, we will say that it is differentiable as well. So the field is going to get its continuity and its differentiability based off of the properties of its components, which are scalar value functions. Okay, so as means of review, a vector field, this is what? Is it a scalar or a vector? Vector. Okay. F and G, what are those? They're the scalar. But they are the components of A. Vector. Which is the? Vector field. Okay, one more time. So the vector F is a what? Vector. vector. F and G are? Scalar. They're scalar value functions that are components of a? Vector. And that vector is the? Vector field. Okay. So here's a few, I'll draw a few examples. The best way to see these and in being introduced to them is just to get an idea of how they behave. I think that's the hardest part, seeing how they behave. So if I define some vector field, 2x, that was a very good 2x, let me do it again. 2x, 2y. Okay, what does that actually mean? Okay, so we step back, each component, of the vector field is just a scalar valued function. Mm -hmm. It's going to, depending on what point I select in R, it's going to take the X value and Y values for each individual component. You plug those in and see what those components should turn out to be. So this is not going to spit out just a whole constant field of vectors. Those vectors are going to be determined by literally where I decide to put the tail or the head um, in, in the Okay, so here's what this one's going to look like. Here's x, here's y. And so essentially what we see is, depending on where I put a point somewhere in this region r, well, let's start at the origin. At the origin, that's 0, 0. So at the origin, both x and y are 0. And if I plug those values into here, we're going to get 0, 0, the 0. So nothing happens. Now, if I step out, to maybe here, right? And I say, okay, well, what happens as we go out? If I take 
the point one comma zero, now I've chosen x to be one and y to be zero. If I happen to plug those into here, I'll get two comma zero. In other words, a vector with some sort of x component. Now, as I increase along the x-axis, what's going to happen to the magnitude of it pointing along the x-axis? And so the way we represent that is it's going to get bigger and bigger in that direction. Now, in the other way, it's going to be negative at first, and then it would increase more negatively. Now, suppose we held x to be 0. So we're going up along the y-axis. Along the y-axis, all x values are going to be 0. And so all of the x components of the vectors in the field are going to be zero. But as we increase our y, what's going to happen to the component, the y component of the vector? It's going to get increased. Yeah. So it'll start at two, but then in the same way that it would increase, it's going to do that in that direction and then also go down. So then depending, this isn't restricted to just these axes. Now, any point in the field is going to behave this way. And this is a very specific type of field. We call this a radial field because of the way it grows outward. So if I were to use it, like if I were to hand calculate and hand plot all of these vectors, you're going to get something that's like that. So it's expanding out of the origin. Okay. So you can think of this as water flow from a fountain or a spring where the spring is coming from the origin. And then the vector field would be describing flow of water from that spring. Um, when you do electricity and magnetism, and you can have positrons and electrons, um, and positive charge, negative charge, you can think about in terms of these fields that they're going to cast out. Right? Now, what happens if I throw a minus sign in front of the minus 2x and the minus 2y? It's yeah. Of... Is the overall pattern going to change? Mm -hmm. No, but what's going to change? The direction, yeah. So it'll be pointing inward. So instead of flowing from a source, it's going to sink into the source. So I could have um, f is equal to minus 2x and minus 2y. Then this radial field, instead of going outward, is going to then be pointing inward. So all the vectors, if I plug those in, would be coming inward. And of course, this, this is infinitely precise. There'd be, there's an infinite number of these things going on because there's an infinite number of points x, y I can plug into the field. But you get the general visual idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. OK, there are a few common fields that you should be generally be familiar with for examples. Um, there are shear fields, and I should I should call these radial somewhere. I'll put it right here. So radial radial fields. Um, there's something called a shear vector field. Um, this can be, say, if you're blowing wind in one direction, and then at one point you're blowing wind in the opposite direction. And essentially, if you're using a vector field to describe the motion of the wind, then you develop a shear field because they're going in opposite directions. Or you can think of this as traffic flow for people who are interested in industrial engineering. Um, let's do so a shear uh, vector field. Oh, wait, I forget. Mechanical engineers look down on industrial engineers. They, they can. I don't know. <laughs> my, uh, my, my neighbor was industrial engineer. He was crazy. crazy like that. But see, the thing is, way, and what industrial engineering is to mechanical engineering is what applied science mathematics is to pure mathematics. Yes. Yeah. So they technically both needed, except for we all know that pure mathematics technically isn't all that. I mean, there's certain things we could definitely get away with not having. <laughs> uh, I basically just canceled the need for me to have a research grant to do anything here with my non-existent music theory stuff. But okay, so here's how this looks. Note: I, I want you to get um, be sure to not attach yourself to. I know you've seen lots of vectors where this is all the stuff in the x component, so you expect to see x's in here. And since it's the y component, you expect to see y's in here. These are fields. Let's go back to the definition. This is a vector. F and G are what? Yeah, how many variables are these taking? Though? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is beyond just what we were doing with those one the, the single dimension real value function. This is allowing these to have x's and y's. So don't think of this as the x component, so to speak, or the y component. Try to keep it separate. Think of this more as an i component and the j component. Because that way you won't accidentally trick your brain into like refusing to accept the concept of x's and y's being inside of uh, the, the i component. Because if you start, if you keep calling this the x component, you'll eventually confuse yourself. Because something like this, you'll be like, hold on, it's like, why is the y component x? And now you just, you know, it's all twisted up. So really the i component, whatever is going to spit out on that component in the vector field for the i direction is the whatever the j component is going to spit out the vector field, depending on where I'm at, will spit out this function, which happens to be x. But don't think that it's got to be some restrictive, all the x's are always going to be over here and all the y's are over here. That's not always going to be the case. If anything, this is, a, this is kind of an exception, a very special type of field, the racial field. Um, so just be aware of that, because that's something that tripped me up a lot when I was first studying this. Um, and it took me a, a week or so to just like, oh, no, that's not right. This is just describing the i component, the j component. And technically, the x's and the y's are more like the address of where we're sourcing where the vectors are. Okay, so the shear vector field, this specific, uh, this specific one is going to look something like this. So here's our x and y. So here's our region R in R2. And notice that the i component of all these vectors is zero. Okay, so that immediately tells us that there's going to be no vectors that are going to be output that have any amount of going either, you know, horizontally. They're all going to be strictly vertical, either up or down. And then depending, we know whether it's up or down based off of the x coordinate. So the x coordinate, if I choose some sort of a point like right there, the x coordinate, this is some x, y. And so this is a little bit more than zero. That's going to tell me what the j component of the output vector is. Is this positive x? Mm -hmm. Is it a very big value x? Mm -hmm. no, not really. So really, we are looking at a relatively small j. So do you see the relationship between those things? This is not necessarily saying, oh, you have to graph that on x axis. No, that is just telling you when you numerically plug in into the field in that specific point, that's the, that's the component that's going to spit out in the j direction. OK, and so if you do this a bunch of times, notice that all of, this is the same. So all of the vectors that are going to be on the same x value have to have the same component for uh, the j. So all of these along here are going to be the same height. I didn't draw that perfectly, but I think it communicates the idea. And then now what happens if I increase my x, though? What's going to happen to our vector field, right? Yeah. So if now the x coordinate, so if I choose an x coordinate like over here now, it's going to be a bigger j component. Does this suddenly mean I have, this is that a bigger x does not necessarily mean bigger x direction. Separate those two, as in the size of x and y versus what the directions are in the components in the field. So this is actually going to be just like a taller along there because it's bigger. And then you can imagine how this pattern goes, right? So then if we go even further, it'll be bigger. This is not drawn to scale, but it's drawn to illustrate. Now, if we go on the other side of the y-axis to negative values of x, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's the same pattern, but now they need to be going in the opposite direction, right? So magnitude-wise, this is pretty much the same, right? Because we've got these smaller ones closer to the y-axis because the magnitude of x isn't that great. And so that means the magnitude of the j component won't be that great. But then as we keep going, it'll mirror over. And so then we get longer ones. And then as we even get further away, we get longer ones, right? And so notice that at the origin here, there is um, whenever x is equal to zero, oh, everything's zero factor. This is a shear vector field. You get two things coming. So think of all the different things you could model um, with a field like that. There are plenty of shear fields in the post-chapel saga line. 
Um, and people who don't know how to navigate a shear field are the people who are waiting and bumping into people and people that are annoying once you run into it and stuff, right? So um, there's other fields like that. Let's see. Channel flow is going to be similar. Actually, that's a good one to do it. Yeah. I know I'm taking a lot of time on this, but the reason why the rest of the chapter is hard is because a lot of times this gets overlooked. And so then you're just handed fields and then asked to basically intuit the, the, the situation of the problem, but you never actually practice the skill of translating what that field realistically is going to visually do. Um, definitions are pedantic. We can always go over those in the lab. Books, but this concept is important. It's like really wouldn't be a good show for me if I'm going to teach you through an entire unit of vector calculus. You can't even express what a field is at the end of this, right? <laughs> so start with the basics and then we'll build on top of this. Let's dive right in. Do the most advanced problem. Most advanced problem. So next to the Maxwell equation. Okay. Channel flow. Channel. I definitely misspelled channel. Yeah. <laughs> I just put an accent on the E and verify it. Um, channel is going to be the field. Okay, now check this out again. Don't get a so don't get attached to your old idea of labeling the first component as the x component because if you do that, you'll be like, well, why is there one minus y squared? Well, because these are scalar valued functions. This is a vector and a component are functions of two variables itself. Okay. So then let me draw this one. Then notice that we're going to be bounding the y's by positive one up here and then negative one down here. So these are kind of like the limits. That was not perfectly drawn, but it's okay. And then notice that. Is anything depending on x in this entire vector field? No. no. Which means that we're not going to have any, basically, the, the location of the x coordinate is not influencing the output of the vector. It's important to know. That's a channel flow. Okay? And so it's behaving this specific thing, 1 minus y squared. So the only thing that we're depending on is the y coordinate. But here's another catch. Where is this in the i component or the j component? Ah, so technically, the resulting vector that gets output in the field, the y coordinate is deciding the magnitude, but ultimately that's deciding a magnitude of the horizontal aspect of this output. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. You got to deal with two steps in there now instead of just one. And so, if I choose all of the y coordinates that are zero, that maximizes what the j component can be, because then I'm subtracting the so one minus zero is one. One, it's the maximal amount of magnitude we can get out of our J component. So the J component is that horizontal or vertical. There is vertical. Wait, did I misspoke? No, no, this is I, sorry. Is the one minus Y squared, this is the I component. So it will be in this way. So this is all with magnitude one here in the center. Because these are all the places where the coordinate of y is zero. And so therefore, the i component of all of the fields should be this vector 1, comma 0. So along the center, we have vectors of the form 1, comma 0. Now, if we increase y, say maybe up here, then to like uh, when y is maybe 1 half. Well, 1 half squared. It's a quarter. And one minus quarter is yeah, three fourths. So it'll be a little bit shorter than here. So here it's going to be a little bit shorter. And this these would be vectors of the form three fourths. Now, there's symmetry, right? Because this is squared. So even if I chose y is equal to negative 1 half, the result is going to be the same. 
these are going to be reflected over in the same size. And then notice that as we get further and further and closer out, it's just going to get closer and closer to zero. Because what if I chose y is equal to one? Yeah, zero vectors. So do you see why I dotted those out? Mm -hmm. And then as we get closer though, it'll be even shorter. So you get really tiny things. And so do you see why it's called channel flow? These fields are not named for no reason. They're named after what they look like. So this is kind of like uh, airport traffic, um, various waiting in line, various motion, or it's like if you certain faucets, it's gonna be moving the fastest, the force is greatest in the center of the stream. Um, this is how rivers and creeks work. Most of the flow is strongest in the center and it's right around the edges. This is where you send Jimmy to go play in the water. This is where you put dad in the tube to go flying down, okay? So uh, fields can talk, can, can express a lot. And we haven't even gotten to the goofy ones, okay? These are like the basics. Mm -hmm. One that I think I'll give for you as an exercise um, is a rotational field. So I'll tell you what it's called because when you think of rotation, well, gee, will occurs, it's gonna be, you better get a field that looks like it's rotating. Um, and it, let's, let's do this one. So there's different kinds of rotational fields. But everyone write that one down in your notes and just on your own time or, during the next, oh, I almost said during next chapel, but this is recorded, so. Um, <laughs> during your next hall meeting, there you go. You can uh, throw that one, say, make sure you can just do that, put these together um, on your own. All right, any questions about drawing the fields or what a field really is representing? Is there a reason we are not exceeding one and negative one? Oh, well, actually we could if you want. What, what happens if I say choose uh, two for one? You get four, which would be a negative number. Yeah, so we change. Yeah. So you actually, along here, there's a shear field mm -hmm. because it's cha immediately changing direction in the opposite direction. Um, but when you restrict the domain of what you want, you can get specific models of what you want. Can, can you go outside of like the, the channel? Uh, like if we went above one. Minute. Yeah, that's what Sam's question basically was. Of like, why are we necessarily stopping here? We're stopping here for this model. We don't have to. And in fact, if you wanted to plug in values that were greater than the one, you're now going to be subtracting a number with a bigger magnitude than one. So now you'll be going in the opposite direction. Yeah. So you actually, along this line, you'll generate a shear field because it switches direction immediately right after that line and both directions too. So over here, we'll change direction. Uh, so yes, but when you have fields, you are allowed to make domain restrictions if you only want to talk about specific things. Good question, though. Anything else on fields? Okay. Let's do okay, 35. That makes sense. Okay, I'll show you that, and then we can do an idea extension because we've been doing those. There's a very specific type of field that I've already alluded to, is the radial field. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the right definition. Right. We're gonna define this vector little r to be the field x, y, okay? Not to be mistaken with just a regular vector, this is a field. Um, and then a vector field, vector field of the form um, uh, f is equal to f x y times r, where f is a scalar value function. This is a radial, is a radial vector field. We looked at the first uh, example of a radial vector field because we were taking 
a scalar value function, which was 2 times xy. In other words, 2x, 2y radial. Okay. Um, the specific interest, uh, there's a specific uh, subset of these radial vector fields that we're interested in, and it is f fields of xy is the ratio of r over the magnitude of r to the p. Which is just the field x, y divided by the magnitude of whatever r is uh, p. And then p is a constant. These will show up in the homework. Um, they're not like the like most important points uh, in the world. And then if you want to compute the magnitude, the magnitude formula for these is magnitude of this radial field is one over the magnitude of r to the p e minus one. And so what we've been doing in two dimensions, I mean, basically the entire theme of this entire class as well, we did it in two, why not in three? Because we can still see it. Um, all the concepts about fields are going to apply. We just need to add one more uh, function into one more component. And so if I want, and so let's, let's call this extend. <laughs> extend, spelled with an L. Okay. X the idea. Okay. So if we started in R2, right? If R2, we had a vector field F with F and G. Okay, again, as a matter of review, um, F and G are what? One more time, F and G are two. Okay, and they are the components of a vector field. The vector field. And so we think about because these can vary with variables x and y, it's helpful to think of that as spitting out an i component in the resulting field, and that the g is varying with two variables in, in the input space x, y, but it's spitting out some sort of a j component in the resulting vector. OK, so what's the difference then if I just pop on one more spatial dimension, right? So if I now have a field F, what could I put in here? FGH. Yeah, just F G H. So now we have, instead of two functions, we have three functions. OK, what kind of functions are F, G, and H? Scalar value functions. One more time. Scalar value functions. And they are the components of A. Vector. Which is the vector field. Yeah. Now, because we have three dimensions, what are F, G, and H varying with respect to? Yes, now there are technically three coordinates that you need to account for in their address to get out, to spit out a value, a X, Y, and Z. So all three of these could contain any of those, any combination of those three variables. And, but the F1 is specifically going to correspond with which um, component, which vector component? I. So the I component is governed by whatever combination F we get here. And then the G, whatever scalar value that G spits out when you plug in a point X, Y, and Z, will J. govern the J component of the vector. And then lastly, H is good. Yes. H will give component. Okay. That wasn't too hard. But do you see why I spend a lot of time on the first definition? Because once you really understand what's going on in the concept, it doesn't take that much imagination to extend it one more. And so the way Pearson presents it, I honestly, I don't know if I, I would never work for Pearson because I would say, hey, this is a bad idea. We should do it this way. And they'd say, no, but it doesn't make enough money. And then I'd be like, oh, never mind. Then. <laughs> yeah, it's all about the money. Unfortunately, it shouldn't be that way. But, uh, you know, I can't wait till I'm like a future grandpa and then I'll still be teaching math. Like, oh yeah, Pearson edition, 57 of <laughs> Yeah, how much money are they going to really rip out of this? <laughs> okay, so this is the um the kind of radial vector field that we're interested in in R2. Should it be any leap of the imagination what it's going to be in R3? 
So I'm not even going to write it because you can do it on your own. Because you see what I'm trying to teach you how to do? Okay. I'm trying to teach you how to take definitions. And then once you've established yourself in the idea, do stuff with the idea. Don't just be a passive blob and be like, okay, I know it now and I forgot it. Because when you interact with an idea in terms of then doing something new with it, you're going to grow far more in mathematical maturity. Uh, because here's the thing, topical knowledge goes and it comes. Um, I can't lecture this from memory because every single year, you think I have all of this memory all the time? Yeah. Actually, some of it. There are some of this which is just in my memory because I've been doing it. Much. But some of these like specific definitions, I jog my memory. But I'm no longer having to relearn. I'm simply showing myself what those recipes were because I've already taught myself the skill of cooking, which is taking those ingredients and then using my critical thinking skills to then put them together and then extend the idea. Okay, so extract concepts while you're getting the topics because when you go and review stuff, that's going to be much more effective study habit in mathematics course. Yeah. Make sense? Okay. Or who, raise your hand if you still have to take linear algebra. Yeah. So whatever I just said is going to pertain a lot when you get to linear algebra in terms of how to study for that. Okay, let's do gradient fields in an example, and then we're done. Okay. As a random update for um, what's going on in terms of my mathematics journey, I have I can finally say with true confidence, I can tell you what continuity is. Yeah. It has been it has been a like a six year long journey, and I can I can I can construct and I can tell somebody what can continuity is in its fullest uh, generality. What's continuity? So continuity is going to be if I take topological spaces x and y. So x. Y are topological spaces. And then if I'm going to define a map that takes what we call X as the domain space into Y, which is a range space where these are uh, sets with defined topologies on them, then I'm given continuity so long as I can say that given an open, an open set V, in the domain space, then I can have, if I were to take the inverse image of an open set of the domain space is an open set in the topology for X, so it's open in X, then that is continuity. So openness, open sets, inverse images of open sets in range spaces being open in the domain space is continuity from the topological spaces. And maybe next, during lab, maybe I'll construct epsilon delta from this. Um, I guess. So I, I'm having fun in mathematics too this semester. I'm not getting as far as I thought I would, but we're getting somewhere. Okay. Uh, let, this, is, this is the important definition for the section, the one might say the exciting consequential concept of the section. But we be different on a region uh, of R2 or R3. Okay, because the idea is going to uh, work the same way. So the vector field the vector field that is generated. Okay, so phi is just a some, some function, a scalar value function. And so what we do is we'll take the gradient of this function because a gradient is a vector. And we learned that in chapter 15. And since gradients are vectors and vector fields are just vectors, well, what happens if those coincide? Okay, so what if I then just take a gradient and say, okay, what if I just let the gradient itself be my field? What if I turn that into a field? And that phi is going to get a special name and be potential function. Okay. Okay, so 
then the, if you take a gradient of a function to generate a field, we call this, this is a chopper gradient field. Gradient field. So no, we don't try to like people with that. It's just what it is. Um, and the function phi is a potential function. Potential function for the field n. Potential function not in the same semantic force as potential roommate or potential wife or potential husband, but potential function as in like, think that the best analogy as you go through this, think potential energy in a gravitational field. That's really where you get that name from. Um, it's coming from gradient fields. Because field, gravitational field, why do we use the word field? Well, maybe because it's a vector field, specifically the vector of a potential function, okay? Why, you, when you get raise something up and it gains potential energy, no, that's not made up because you're talking, you're describing its magnitude in the potential function in the, in the field that is the gravity. Okay. And we'll talk more about that when we do conservative vector fields um, and conservative, not as in I voted for Trump vector fields, but it, we'll talk about, again, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> There's so many wonderful math words that I'll just willfully, because I'm a math major, if someone brings up these terms, I'll just deliberately read the mathematical definition into what they're saying. Get confused. Um, let's do let's do an example, because we need to get that done before class ends. So you'll need to know how to do this. Compute the gradient field that is the gradient of some potential function. If you are given the potential function x, y, z is equal to e to the minus z sine. So let's do this. I mean, nothing is great. It's just a gradient. So I could say, I could find all of my partial derivatives. Um, partial derivative with respect to x is, okay, this becomes a constant because we don't care about that. Here's the variable and it's a linear. And so it's just going to be sine of the variable plus a constant. So to go to from sine to cosine. So here's the constant multiplier. Sine goes to cosine, and by the chain rule, I multiply by the derivative of this plus a constant. And it's going to be just one, so that's that. And then phi y, okay, so it's a very, very similar construction because now x and y have just created places of who's going to be the variable, but sine is still going to go to what? Right, so the constant multiplier up front, e to the minus z, and then the sine goes to cosine of the x plus y. And then again, chain rule, well, derivative, that's just one, that's going to go to zero, so we just multiply by one. Cool. And then now that, so pz, okay, suddenly this just becomes a number, okay, so constant multiplier, blah, and then e to the minus z, don't forget a chain rule, so we will put the minus sign up front, it'll be negative e to the minus z, negative e to the minus z, and then our constant multiplier, hanging out for the right. So a gradient field takes the component, basically just takes the gradient, that vector in itself is the field. So you could say, okay, so my gradient field f equal to the gradient of v is just in the x component, vx, in the y component, dy, z component, dz. So this is e to the minus z cosine x plus y. e to the minus z cosine x plus y, e to the minus z cosine x plus y again, minus z cosine x plus y, and the z is minus e to the minus z, z minus e minus z sine x plus y, that's a vector. 
This is obviously slightly more complicated than what we started with at the beginning of the lecture. I did not expect you to be able to grab that by hand. But if you're curious, you can throw it into an engine and it'll, it'll spit out what this potential function, when you take such a function, then turn it into a field, what you get. And the really, really cool thing about this is it kind of begs the question, how many interesting two-dimensional functions have we talked about that if we were to take their gradient, we generate a field? You know, what kind of field are we getting? And um, so, yeah, there's, there's, it opens the door for a lot of different ideas, if you're interested. Okay, this is a really important example. Um, know how to do this skill. You're going to need to do it in pretty much everything. So there's that. Although it's not even a new skill, right? Because you've been doing gradients since two chapters ago. So, okay, there's just a few vocabulary words that we can do and then we're done. These aren't the most important definitions of the world, but I just realized that as I read them through the textbook, that if you see these in Pearson and I don't mention them, it'll be a little bit like, hey, you know, what's going on? So, just so you're aware of what can be thrown at you, but also to allude to the kinds of applications that you'll have of this content, um, past child three and into your other classes. Um, <laughs> This marker is a trooper, but I think this is the last run on this marker. The level curves, level curves of a potential, uh, potential function are called Equipotential curves. It's a fun word. Equipotential curves. Um. So okay, what does equipotential mean? Okay. Um. I'll add that in parentheses here. So think of this as like your curves. Um. Let's say on which the potential function. So you have a potential function p to start with, uh, where the your potential function is constant. Okay, so a physical example of this could be say say you're walking on a hiking trail and there's like a oh, like a hill or something, and if you stand at a certain elevation on the side of the hill and I ask you, okay, so like here's your hill, and I, you know, place you right here. And I ask you to walk around the entire hill without changing your elevation. Okay, well, depending on how the hill is contoured, right, you'll go around. And essentially, the height of this, think of this surface as the potential function. And so what you've essentially done is you've traversed all of the points on which that potential function doesn't change its output value. In other words, constant. Now we're going to do that. It's not always physically manifested like this, but the visual can be nice if you're more of a visual learner. But think of the equipotential also as being so if you have um, magnetic charges in a space, or if you have systems oh, with, like doing gravitational systems, um, and what's going to be influencing those kinds of things, an equipotential curve at that point is going to be these curves that are sets of points that are being influenced in the same exact way or have the same value in the potential function. Um, from which you're generating your field. And then we also say that flow curves, flow curves, which we also call streamlines, depending on the physical context of them at that point, are um, everywhere orthogonal. Or orthogonal to the echo potential curve. Okay, so everybody has seen those those magnet pictures where you know you go to your highly rigorous sixth grade electricity and magnetism lab book, it gives you a bar magnet, 
Let's make this one north, make this one south. Ooh, quiz time for you guys haven't taken physics with Greg. <laughs> All right. Um, does it go north to south or south to north? North to south. Yeah. And so the potential function you're getting here, that wasn't bad considering I have a very strong distaste for sign. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So these what when the what's what's really being represented here are not the equipotential curves, they're the streamlines. These are the flow curves. These curves are everywhere orthogonal to equipotential. Okay. And so if you think about what's orthogonal to these, and that's you'll find all of these equipotential um curves interacting with your field, which is being drawn out essentially by the streamlines. That's how you can visually connect. So in the beginning, when we were drawing out like the arrows discreetly, the streamline takes that idea of visually representing how the field is behaving by then making it all smooth and like connecting together all of the directions. So that's this is just one of, there's so many different examples that you could do with this kind of stuff. So are there any questions about definitions? of the field or the gradient, computing a gradient field. Again, gradient field is going to be kind of the most important thing you take out of 17.1. Go ahead. Okay, let me stop this recording real quick for the lecture.